Good morning, my dear students. Uh, in my earlier class, I was uh, discussing certain aspects of what is called as uh, the concepts of biodiversity. After completing the discussion on the concepts, today in our class, we are going to move to a very important area called conservation of biodiversity. Now, all of you may wonder what is the need for conservation? Of course, we have to understand the concept of biodiversity. But why should we conserve the biodiversity? Now, the problem is only very recent. If, if this lecture is going to be a little bit about 50 or 60 years back, I would not have given a lecture on conservation of biodiversity because the nature was conserving all by itself. But what happened in the last 50 or 60 years, there is a lot of a deterioration. There is a lot of a changes in the biodiversity that we have, we, it, it necessitated us to take some steps to conserve the biodiversity. Because the components of the organisms of the of the natural society it is a slowly fading away from the scene they are all vanishing from the face of the earth so it becomes imperative on our part to take some steps to conserve the biodiversity now this Biodiversity conservation. First, we should know why we conserve the biodiversity. As I was telling you, we have to conserve the biodiversity because of these two reasons narrow utilitarian value and broadly utilitarian value. What is a narrow utilitarian value? <coughs> See, the narrowly utilitarian value people, those who are arguing, they say that. The, Humans derive countless benefits from nature. They derive the benefits from the nature in the form of the food, firewood, fiber, construction materials, and then industrial products, which are tannins, lubricants, dyes, resins, perfumes, etc. <coughs> Above all, this is the most most important value of the nature that is what is called as a medicinal medicinal plants there's a lot of things to be discussed about the medicinal plants see so many medicinal plants we are having in this world which goes unnoticed by us so these are all the utilitarian value of the plants <coughs> The narrowly utilitarian value still continues. More than 25 percentage of the drugs are derived from the plants. As I was telling you, 25,000 species of plants are contributed to the traditional medicines used by native peoples around the world. Nobody knows how many more medicinally useful plants are there in tropical rainforests waiting to be explored. So, this shows that so many plants are there which uh, remain to be explored, which remain unexplored. They are in the tropical rainforest where men, men cannot go approach and then have a thorough study of the plants. So nearly 25,000 plants uh, today we are using for medicinal purposes. With increasing resources are put into bioperspecting products. Nations endowed with a rich biodiversity can expect to reap enormous benefits. What about a broadly utilitarian value? The broadly utilitarian argument says that biodiversity plays a major role in many ecosystem services that nature provides. A fast dwindling Amazon forest is estimated to produce through photosynthesis 20 percentage of the total oxygen in the earth's atmosphere see 
ट्वेंटी परसेंटेज ऑफ द टोटल ऑक्सीजन जस्ट इमेजिन जस्ट इमेजिन इफ यू हैव टू प्रोड्यूस दिस ट्वेंटी परसेंटेज ऑफ दिस आई मीन ऑक्सीजन व्हिच इज प्रेजेंट इन द एटमॉस्फेयर इन द लेबोरेटरी हाउ मच कॉस्ट यू हैव टू स्पेंड हाउ मच मनी यू हैव टू स्पेंड यू कैन इमेजिन Above all, there is what is called as a pollination, without which the plants cannot survive in this world. Because only when a pollination is over, they get fertilized, they set seeds, and then these seeds ought to be dispersed. Then they germinate, and then they produce the plants of next generation. All these things are going on in a cyclic fashion in the nature. If there are no pollinators in this world, then Oh, you cannot, you cannot survive in this world. One scientist very rightly remarked that if all the bees are getting vanished from this earth within six months, not more than that, within six months, the whole earth will come get devastated. All the people will die because within these six months, already existing crops, already existing seeds and fruits. somehow we will be able to survive if there are no bees in this world no new fruits no seeds will be formed and then all of us will have to die plants and animals everything we have to die so if only we are not going to have the bees for continuously for 6 months if all the bees are dying in this world we will also die very quick so the pollinators are very important then most important thing is the aesthetic pleasure just you see can anything else in this world give the pleasure of walking through a thick forest watching spring flowers waking up to a to a bulbul's song in the early morning which can give this a pleasure to you other than the plants and animals just imagine it is only that these plants and animals which can give these a pleasure which which will give us this happiness in the world so these are all the some of the benefits that we are uh, deriving from the nature of plants and animals so, so we have to take some measures to conserve the plants this conservation is divided into two categories in situ conservation and ex situ conservation in the in situ conservation we are going to discuss about biosphere reserves national parks reserve forest wildlife sanctuaries sacred groves world heritage sites so that means most they are natural so uh, i mean uh, structures so these are all uh, these are all naturally occurring in this world and then Uh, this naturally occurring uh, i mean uh, areas we have to maintain okay one by one we are going to discuss before that exit methods botanical gardens and uh, herbal gardens arboreta and aquaria zoos and uh, zoological parks breeding centers bio banks gem blossom collections molecular banks so these are also some of the very important uh, methods of our ex situ conservation of the nature now this uh, slide gives you a beautiful classification of in situ and ex situ classification <coughs> see the in situ classification it is a done in a protected area network that's very important so that is in the form of the sacred groves biosphere reserves national parks and wildlife sanctuaries that biosphere reserve is once again divided into terrestrial and marine going to the ex situ conservation <coughs> sacred plants and home gardens are there the seed banks are being maintained by us nowadays and then now we maintain in the seed bank some of the plants and seeds etc botanical gardens arboreta zoological gardens aquaria these are all present and there we are able to do ex situ conservation of the plants good now we have taken the first one 
what is called as a biodiversity hotspots. Biodiversity hotspots are regions with very high levels of species richness and a high degree of endemism. What is the meaning of the word endemism? <coughs> endemism is the species confined to that region not found anywhere else. A particular plant is seen only in that area and nowhere it is seen. That type of plants are called as endemic plants, endemism. Initially, 25 biodiversity hotspots were identified, but subsequently 9 more have been added to the list, bringing the total number of biodiversity hotspots in the world to 34. So, presently, 34 hotspots have been identified by the naturalists. Okay. Biodiversity hotspots and continuing. These hotspots are also regions of accelerated habitat loss. Three of these are Western Ghats and Sri Lanka, Indo Burma, Himalayas. Although all the biodiversity hotspots put together cover less than 2% of the Earth's land area, listen to this very carefully. Listen, please. <coughs> All the hotspots areas, all the hotspots areas put together is, is uh, aggregating to only 2% of the earth's land area collectively. But still, the number of species they collectively harbor is extremely high and a strict protection of these hotspots could reduce the ongoing moth extinction by almost 30, 30%. So now it tells you how much the bioconservation, biodiversity conservation is very much needed, particularly in this situation. So a strict protection is needed so that at least 30% of the uh, extinctions which is going at a particular level rate could be under a uh, uh, control. Biodiversity rich regions. <clears throat> in India, ecologically unique and biodiversity rich regions are legally protected as biosphere reserves, national parks and sanctuaries. You see, today the life has become like that therefore for, the, uh, for anything you need a uh, uh, protection of law. See, if there is no law, then you cannot claim anything as your right. If you want to claim anything as your right, you should have a protection of law. Law protection should be there. So, ecologically unique and biodiversity rich regions are legally protected. You must have a legal protection. That's very important today. In the changed scenario of this world. It's not like a, the life about 1000 or 2000 years back. Today, for anything, you need a legal protection to get yourself protected from all the hazards of nature. So, these are legally protected areas and these are divided into, as I told you, biosphere reserves, national parks and centuries. Uh, India now has 14 biosphere reserves, 90 national parks and 448 wildlife centuries. India has also a history of religious and cultural traditional centers. Okay, that's more important. Above all, this is a history of religious and cultural traditional centers are there. In addition to this, biosphere reserves. Man and biosphere program was proposed by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, what we call as UNESCO. They are large tracts encompassing several national parks, several nation and encompasses national several national parks, reserves, reserves or centuries to attain sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity by integrating a harmonious relationship between man and his environment. If a man has to live a 
healthier life then his environment should be protected it is not by eating food alone you are living in this world remember it's by inhaling the air it is by inhaling the oxygen you are living so if your environment is much polluted then you can't live a peaceful life you will get only a disease life if you are if your environment has to be protected then the <clears throat> biodiversity should also be protected so this man in biosphere program was proposed and it was in it, it was initiated by unesco united nation educational and scientific cultural organization a beautiful one of the international organizations it is what are sacred groves what are sacred groves sacred groves are found in but okay fine before going to that i will just explain what a sacred grove is see sacred groves are land mosses or it could be an aquatic mass also it is being protected by i mean uh, not uh, i mean uh, legal laws but man made custom usually a sacred grove will be having normally it will be having a temple okay and then surrounding the temple you will be having a forest number a number of trees will be there and then uh, sometimes the temple and all it will vary it is a very big topic sacred grove is a very big topic okay i am discussing only the periphery of it the temple may be very small uh, very large it could be a very traditional temple or it could be even a modern temple so a temple will be there surrounding that there will be a there may be a thick forest or there may be a very thin forest or at least a few plants will be there so surrounding the particular temple area we should not kill any plant or any animal so that this has gone into our culture this has gone into our system of life our our parents our forefathers grandma grandpa grandpa everybody has told us that in and around the area of the temple should not be disturbed you you, you should not cut the plants these are plants are attached with religious importance and the animals there you have to protect they should not be killed so these are this is the what is known as the sacred groves certain animals you see today also in the temples uh, we have got a different uh, gods i got a lot of muruga parvati uh, so many gods are there in hindu in the culture and you see each each animal each each god will have his own animal but muruga is a having peacock and uh, shiva is a having snake that is why we are we, we don't we don't uh, dare enough to kill all these animals see this a uh, concept came in the mind of the man about uh, thousands and thousands of years back if you are going to attach some importance to the plant and animals religious importance then we will not be unnecessarily disturbing the environment that is the main concept about that the main thing is it's not uh, as though some of the plants and animals or uh, got some what is a magical powers it's not at all like that when you attach these animals and plants to the religious importance then we will not be unnecessarily killing or damaging that plant so this is what is called as a sacred grove so these sacred groves are found in kashi and uh, jainsha hills of meghalaya aravalli hills of rajasthan western god regions of uh, karnataka and maharashtra sarjuja of uh, chandra and vaster areas of madhya pradesh in mahalaya the sacred groves are the lost refuges for a large number of rare and threatened species rare and threatened species a beautiful concept <coughs> the plants are becoming very very rare still worse condition is the threatened condition the plants are being threatened of being extinct so after some if a, when a rare plant is being threatened then uh, still if you don't uh, care for that plant then it will become extinct there is the next stage there is the next stage so these uh, many plants in this mahalaya are now have become rare and threatened all these things that tell us how we should uh, at least now we should uh, be able to protect our nature <coughs> now 
reserve forest. Reserve forests are a legal units for whole nature. It's an area marked for protecting a specific ecosystem. <clears throat> the forward environment of a specific animal or plant. It is a water catchment area. It is an area of a scientific, aesthetic, cultural, educational and recreational interest. What do you mean by education? Children, you take the school children, college children there and then you educate them with the plant and the animal science, the botany and the knowledge. They become, they, they become the areas, the natural studies. You take them to the forest, you take them to the park, you take them to any natural environment, introduce them to the nature. They become very much excited. It has got their aesthetic value. It is uh, going in our black cultural value. Okay. So these reserve forest, they not only protect their plants, but also they are of recreational interest for the human being. Saptapura National Park is the first reserve forest. Saptapura National Park is the first reserve forest. Five. Areas earmarked for protecting characteristics uh, ecosystem. As the natural process is ensured in them, the resident fauna and flora flourish in a natural ambience. In addition, these are the areas of a scientific, educational and aesthetic and cultural scientific also. This is what the, this is the point is uh, repeated. Okay, doesn't matter. When we tell many times, the students absorb it in their mind. If, if anything is uh, told once, you don't normally take it into your mind. That is why we are repeating certain very important points. What are national parks? <clears throat> Jim Gorbett National Park is India's first national park. Haley National Park was established in 9, 1935 and now it has been renamed as the world's first national park, the Yellowstone National Park. It was created in 1872 in about 8 lakhs 98,000. 317 hectares. 95 national parks in India are there. 95 national parks are there in India. They cover an area of they cover an area of 38,024.1 kilometer square. 1.1 percentage of the geographical area of the country. So 1.1 percentage of 1.16, this means 1.2, it is going above 5, it can the tail. 1.2 geographical area is in the form of the national park in our country. So, this is something very good to hear. World heritage sites. These are places of importance <coughs> of a cultural and a natural heritage as described in the UNESCO World Heritage Convention established in 1972. In India, they are, they are recognized by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization on 29 as of 2012. What are the national heritage sites? Kaziranga National Park. Kaziranga National Park. Manas Wildlife Sanctuary. Caladio National Park. Sundarbans National Park, which is in Calcutta. Sundarbans. Nanda Devi and her Valley of Flowers. Western Gods. So, these are all some of the 
natural heritage sites of our country. Should I repeat? Gaziranga National Park, Manas Wildlife Sanctuary, Clear Clearla Dio National Park, Sundarbans of West Bengal, Calcutta National Park, Nanda Devi and the Valley of Flowers, Western Ghats, oh, which is in the which is encompassing um, Kerala. Then Karnataka and Maharashtra. This is stretch complete western guards. It, it will be completing at least four states. Some areas, Kanyakumari area and other areas of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Maharashtra, all these areas. Western guards, it is running all these states. It's a long stretch, it's a very long stretch. Yet sit to conservation. <coughs> The historic convention of a biological diversity, the Earth Summit, held in Rio de Janeiro, held in Rio de Janeiro, in 1992, called upon all nations to take appropriate measures for conservation of a biodiversity and sustainable utilization of its benefits. So this is a, uh, it's coming under exit to conservation. The first Earth Summit held in Rio de Janeiro called upon the nations to take appropriate measures for conservation of biodiversity. Because it is in, in around about these years we started realizing that our biodiversity has to be conserved. Because if there is no conservation, the nature will be at a peril and there is a danger of uh, this being lost in it. So in these years, even before this, 1970 and all, we knew that uh, we are losing our natural wealth. So the Earth Summit was organized and in that organization, that, that uh, meeting, so the point was emphasized that the biodiversity should be conserved. What is exeter conservation? It could be once again in the form of the zoological parks, botanical gardens, wildlife uh, safari parks, etc. Okay, there are many animals that have become extinct in the wild but continue to be maintained in the zoological parks. Very good. So nowadays, uh, if you want to see some wild, very wild animals, a cheetah, lion, tiger, etc., if you want to show these animals to the children, then when you go, you have to go to Gir Forest of Gujarat to show the lion to the uh, children. But if you go to your zoo, then it will be there. Of course, it will be in your cage. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. At least your facility is there. Nowadays, the open area zoos have also come. One best example is a Wandalo Zoo in our Tamil Nadu itself. It is an open area zoo. The animals are not put in the cage. They are allowed to roam about in the forest. But of course with a lot of security. A lot of security. With, with all these securities, about a one year back, uh, one man fell in there in the Wandalo Zoo and then he died. That is a different matter. A totally a different matter. It is because of our carelessness. But open uh, zoos, are also uh, becoming a new concept because all the time when you are putting the animals in the cage, what happens? After a long period, about uh, six months, one year or two years, the animals, they are not able to live a normal life within a very small cage of uh, uh, 10 feet by 8 feet or uh, 10 feet. How the animals will live? They can to breed freely and they can to bring their own young ones freely. So we have understood the difficulties of these animals and then we are allowing them to I mean, uh, lead a mostly, nearly a natural life. Nearly a natural life. You can't give a 10% natural life for these animals. It's, a, it's a very difficult. So we are trying to provide a nearly a natural life for these animals and then allow them to have a natural population, uh, free population and then bring uh, yielding the young one, bringing their own young uh, babies. 
all these things, this uh, concept we have understood. And then open type of Zusa have also come into, but it is very difficult to maintain cost-wise, but still you have to do it, you have to do it. If you want to conserve the nature, you should not mind about the money, you have to do it. Okay. So these are all some of the, uh, I mean, to conservations. There are many animals that have become extinct in the wild, life, wild uh, but continue to be maintained in the zoological parks. In recent years, exotic conservation has advanced beyond keeping threatened species in enclosures. Exotic conservation of uh, plants <coughs> harbor collections of uh, taxa of major conservation value of that region. Compared to crops, normally we, we don't um, conserve any crop here, but mostly forest species, endangered species, threatened species, and the trees who normally we have it in the botanical gardens. So, ornamental species, trees are preferred in the botanical gardens. Mostly we prefer the trees when compared to the crops and the ornamental species. So, organize the planned and a systematic display of the plants of various categories are there in the botanical gardens. Most maintain the herbarium and the database also. Many botanical gardens, they maintain the herbarium and also the database of all the plants. That also they are doing a beautiful work. Some of the very interesting information about the botanical gardens, 1,500 worldwide with 35,000 plant species are there in the botanical gardens today. International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, <coughs> classified 2,700 of these as rare, threatened and endangered plants. I was just mentioning about these. When a plant becomes rare, after that it will become a threatened species. Then it will become danger, endangered. Then it will move to the next stage called extinct. It will become extinct. Even at this stage, if you don't take care. The Royal Botanical Gardens of England, Kew Gardens, the oldest in it is the oldest in, uh, in the world, and uh, it is uh, containing nearly twenty-five thousand species. Zoological gardens or zoological parks, you call them. Wild animals of varied habitats and taxa and regions are kept as animal exhibits. Modern zoos are called zoological gardens or parks, quite large and provide a near natural habitat. This was what I was remarking just a few minutes back. Near natural habitat. In the olden days, about a hundred years back, we used to uh, nurture the animals in the cages. You see the monkeys, all the birds, even the birds. There will be a very small cage. About uh, 20 or 25 birds will be there. And they will be all uh, giving a very sicky look when the moment you were there. And then when you go there uh, near the, some of the animals, they produce a stinging smell. That smell will be there. That is why most people, they don't go to the zoo at all because the moment you return from there, you get all the respiratory problems because of the infection. But nowadays, we are, uh, we are trying to provide the maximum comfort, comfort to the animals also. So we try to give them near natural habitat for these animals. Vienna Zoo, kind of, uh, established in 1752, is the first recognized zoo of the world. The Vienna Zoo established in 1752, is the first zoo of the world. Okay. Zoological Gardens. The Central Zoo Authority of India established in 1992 under the Wildlife Protection Act. We, we, <coughs> a stage come, came when we thought that the wildlife has to be protected and an act was made for this called Wildlife Protection Act. This was enacted in the year 1992. As a part of that, the Central Zoo Authority of India, they brought in changes. These are, there are about uh, 
200 zoos in India. 200 zoos in India. The Marble Palace Zoo, 1854, it was started in Calcutta. Oldest zoo in Madras, it's called the Madras Zoo. It was started in 1855. Now it has been shifted to a modern and large area called Aringarna Zoological Park, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. And this is also sometimes popularly called as a Vandalur Zoo. Because it is in a place called Vandalur near Chennai, about 30-25 kilometers from Chennai proper. In a place called Vandalur, you have got this uh, zoo and it has been named after the uh, one of the great uh, chief ministers of uh, Chennai, Aringaranna Zoological Park, Vandalur Zoo. And uh, it is one of the very old zoo. It was uh, started in 1854 in the central uh, pop, uh, position, central place of a uh, zoo in Chennai. In Egmore, it was there, but then we thought that it should be uh, in a very larger area. Then it was uh, shifted to that area. Okay, it was, I think it was uh, shifted about uh, 20 or 25 years back. Now, we have got some uh, latest techniques of uh, conserving. Now, gametes of a threatened species can be preserved in viable and fertile condition for long periods using cryopreservation techniques. What do you mean by the word cryopreservation? Cryo means ice. Cryo means ice. So, when you put them in the ice, you preserve. Don't you know that if you want to preserve anything in your home, you put it in the refrigerator? Even your own items, cooker, samba, rasa, oriya, all these things, all everything after eating together, you put it in the fridge so that it is not getting contaminated. So, when you take the things to a sub zero level, then they are successfully preserved. Microorganisms cannot grow. So, this technique is already set as a cryopreservation. Cryo means ice. It's called a cryopreservation technique. Eggs can be fertilized in vitro. Plants can be propagated using tissue culture methods. Seeds of a different genetic strains of a commercially important plants can be kept for a longer period in the seed banks. Okay. So, that's a very important thing of the cryopreservation as I was telling you. When you have some seeds and it has to be preserved, so you put it in your sub, I mean, minus degrees, put them in a very chill condition, then there is a successful method of uh, preservation. By this method also we can conserve. They have got what is known as yeah, germplasm bags. Sorry, it's a mistake. You don't preserve the gems. Germ blossom. Now, these uh, gene banks or germ blossom banks, preservation of the seeds, plants, tissues, pollens, DNA, gene bank maintain live plant collections, at least 1500 genotypes are there. Tropical Botanical Garden and Research Institute, what is it called is a TBG or a very famous institute, a national institute, which is in a pile of Kerala. Kerala. TBG or a Tropical Botanical Garden and Research Institute. Now, this is one of the very important where they record the germ plasm. Then, International Rice Research Institute of IRRI, International Research Rice Institute. Rice Research Institute. But the Philippines has a 1,13,000 varieties of rice. Institute of Plant Genetic Resources, IPGRI, New Delhi, is also another germplasm uh, bank. So these are all some of the germplasm banks where we are having. So uh, as I have told you, nearly 1,500 genotypes are maintained here. Once again. <laughs> Well, what is the benefits of the cryopreservation? This is storing the seeds under frozen conditions, a minus 196 degrees. It slows down the rate at which they lose their ability to germinate. Okay. So it, it slows down the rate of 
ability to germinate. It survives for centuries. It can be revived. It offers an insurance uh, technique. Recently, a yeah, 6,000 years of old lotus seed has been germinated successfully. A yeah, 6,000 year old lotus seed has been germinated. You know one thing? This is a career preservation technique. And it may look very modern. The idea is very modern. When you take the seeds and then uh, put it in your cryo, it, it, is, uh, it will be there for a quite longer time. This idea was there in the man, the Indians, the Hindus, for, for a quite long time. Now, in the, uh, in, in the temples, go from what we call the temples, then you have got uh, these structures, what we call as a kalasam. There may be five or seven or now in this normally the, the if you take and then see there will be only seeds. Seeds of the different grains which are very important. Because the people thought that in, in when there is a temple and then if there is going to be a very big loss, very big flood, earthquake, and something is going to happen. If the whole village is going to meet with the uh, devastation, if all the people are going to die, then at least the seeds should be there and it should be taken to the next generation. So at the top of this Gopuram, in, in the Kalasams, they, they, are, they are preserved only the seeds. If you take the seeds, then once in 60 years, during that what is called as a Kumbhavi Shegam, they will take and then put the new grains and then do it. This concept was there for us. We, we, we knew the technique. This, of course, the career preservation technique is a new, but even in the old traditions, it was there. Okay. What has happened? Okay, that's come. <clears throat> so, these are all some of the career preservation techniques, you see. How it has been put in a beautiful um, in, uh, um, walls and then uh, uh, it is uh, completely sealed and uh, nothing will happen to this. Finally, it will, uh, it, will be, it, it could be preserved for any length of time, say about uh, even 500 to 600 years or even 1000 years. Seed banks. <coughs> Seeds can be maintained for decades, for centuries. Under controlled conditions, <coughs> that is less than 5 degrees humidity and minus 20 degrees Celsius. Not all species are suited for this treatment, of course. <coughs> this is one of the drawbacks. Seeds need to be regularly germinated to renew stock <coughs> or the seeds will eventually lose their viability. Seed banks are at risk from power failure, natural disaster and wars. This has been taken care of now. I will show you my last slide how it has been beautifully maintained there. Duplicate stocks can be maintained. Seeds kept are stable and don't change with the time of environment. So these are all some of the very beneficial things about the seed banks. <coughs> Selva the global seed vault. <coughs> In February 2008, Selva global seed vault was established. It was uh, built near the village of Long Yerbian on the island of Spitsbergen. The wallet at its inception contained 268,000 distinct samples of seeds, each one originating from a different farm or field in the world. Each sample may contain hundreds of seeds or more. In all, the shipments of seeds are secured in the valley today weighed approximately 10 tons. That is so much, so many kilos. Filling 676 boxes, 130 miles deep in the snow. See how much care has been taken for protecting. Well, next slide, beautiful slide will show how this has been done. See, 
first it, uh, there will be a bridge. If the bridge is closed, no one can approach. It is connected by a bridge. So there will be a tunnel entrance here. There is an office and a handling area. So airlock doors will be there. Seed valets are here. The seed valets are here. Okay. And then office then. Sleeve to protect the tunnel from the erosion and the climatic changes. They, they are, their estimate is about a thousand, even for thousand years, it will be there. No earthquake, no volcano, nothing is going to affect it. As I have just now told you, it's about a, uh, 130 miles, sorry, it should be meters, 130 meters, 130 meters deep in the snow. 130 meters deep in the snow, they have put it. And 670 boxes are there. These boxes. 676 boxes are there and it is uh, there. <clears throat> so this is a method for preserving the seeds. So, in my today's class, I was able to give you a beautiful, uh, I mean, uh, um, a, a beautiful concept was developed to you. See, what is the need for preserving, for conserving the nature? In how many ways we can, what is the uh, narrow objective, broad objectives on the need for conservation? Then we classified the conservation techniques into two types, namely in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. So why you should have a natural park, zoological park, botanical gardens. All these things, uh, <coughs> they, they help us only to maintain the uh, plants and animals which are getting extinct. Now above all these uh, things, so don't think that you are uh, trying to protect the animals and the plants and if this is a favor done to the plants and animals, you should not uh, think, think in that way. See above all these things, uh, we get some pleasure, we get some happiness when you uh, live in a natural environment, when you are in a natural ambience, we get the pleasure, we are able to live in here very what is called as a healthier life you are able to live a healthier life it is a for that we have to protect our nature okay so i i hope uh, you children will also take some care about the plants and animals at least uh, from today onwards if you have not cared for them till yesterday thank you